Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor, and today I'm going to talk to you about coincidences and the coincidences that have brought you and I here and Ripple and XRP. How have we all been brought here? I'm going to show you a string of, co of IMF coincidences. And after I show you that string of IMF coincidences, you have to ask yourself at that point, how many how many coincidences can there be until it is no longer a coincidence? This quote right here is from Jeremy Lin. You can try to call it coincidence, but at the end of the day, there are 20, 30 things when you combine them all that had to happen at the right time in order for me to be here. That's why I call it a miracle. And folks, as I sit here, and I'll tell you just for a second about who Jeremy Lin is. But as I sit here, not just me being here, but also where we are with Ripple and what they're working on and where we are with XRP and where the world is, this is all not a coincidence. This is a miracle is what it is. Now, that doesn't mean that there haven't had to be a lot of ups and downs and, and arounds and, and, you know, the, the pain in the pit of your stomach, that's, that's all a part of everything. That's just the way life works. But it's still a miracle what, what is going on and, in my opinion, what is about to go on. Um, but there are no coincidences. This is not a coincidence. And, and by the way, as long as we're showing you this quote by Jeremy Lin, I pulled up his Wikipedia page. For those of you that don't know the story, story of Jeremy Lin, I think he even wrote a book. You should read it. If there's ever been a story about never giving up, this guy embodies the story. He's basically a basketball player. I believe he played at, at Harvard. But the guy was one of these guys that was just, when it came to the NBA, he, he just wasn't, he didn't get the chance that he wanted. And at some, he just never quit and he kept playing. And at some point, this was back in, I believe, 2012, he was given a, ch a chance due to due to several different um, things that happened. He was given a chance to play for the New York Knicks. And when he did, he performed so well that it created an entire phenomena that they called Linsanity. So if you haven't ever read up or seen, go watch YouTube, some of the highlight reels on this guy. It'll blow your mind. But it illustrates, but, it, but, I, but I thought that his quote, about how, yeah, you can say, oh, that he, he got lucky. He just showed up and, and got lucky and played well. And that's just, it's just a coincidence. And he's telling you here, no, there are so many things, wins and losses, uh, wins and failures and different things that had to happen to this guy. And he had to never give up and he kept on, kept keeping on. And he eventually got to where he was meant to be. And he showed the world what he was about. Now, the way I'm relating this today is all of the things that we have that we have watched. And, and the reason I wanted to go over this is because there are so many of you out there who were not here for the last two or three years. And it's important that you understand. And I'm sorry this video is going to be long. Sometimes I tend to do that. But this it's going to be worth it if you'll hang with me. Because at the end of this video, if you think Ripple and XRP and all of this is just a coincidence, this will change your mind. So hang in there. Okay. But first I wanted to go through a few different things. The first is, um, when I asked Tim Draper the, the question about whether he owned XRP, that has eventually been picked up by some of the media. Billionaire Tim Draper on XRP. It's happening. It's coming. And then here's the article, uh, billionaire Tim Draper on XRP. It's happening. And they go through this. I don't even think they mentioned my name, but the whole article is basically about uh, what came out from me asking him the question in the link to um, investor conference. 
Um, but here's uh, XRP Crypto. We'll kind of summarize it. Billionaire Tim Draper says he owns XRP and he believes that XRP and other cryptocurrency are very important for the world. This is bigger than the Internet. It's bigger than the Iron Age, the Renaissance. It's bigger than the Industrial Revolution. That sounds like things I want to put on a thumbnail because that he this guy, there's nothing better than enthusiasm, folks. And this now I say enthusiasm, enthusiasm backed by belief, because enthusiasm backed by it, it, by non-belief is nothing more than fraud. This guy is an enthusiastic person who is backed by belief. He believes in what he's talking about. He knows what's coming. And I, I, I told him myself, I said, you, the world needs more of your enthusiasm, and it does. Okay, um, XRP Crypto Wolf, he, uh, several things today, as usual. Visa wants to advance its crypto payment tech and help banks explore digital currency. Visa wants to leverage its expertise to assist both central banks as they think about CBDC, as well as other firms that are exploring privately issued stable coins. That stable coin word keeps popping up, doesn't it? And then XRP Crypto Wolf again. Ripple is hiring a director of project management uh, of project management platform. Ripple's new director of project management or product management will manage RippleNet protocol and develop internal governance for managing it. And then we have this. This is uh, from Stephen Bull Diep, and um, it's a it's an inflation quote. This is a guy that was on Anthony Pompliano's show, and I thought this was a good quote. Fiat currency is not a new thing. Really. Like, like it started, I think, 7th century China was the first one. Every one of them have ended in hyperinflation. This is not like it happens sometimes. Every time it happens. Mm -hmm. And the only, you know, the best performing one today is the British pound. 317 years old, it's lost 99.5% of its value, right? And as you said, we're living through its kind of normal life cycle. Um, they all trend towards zero. It's just, a, it's an empirical fact. Mm -hmm. So... In this sense, as a wise man once said, inflation is the surest way to fertilize the rich man's field with the sweat of the poor man's brow. Which I, I really wow. Like. Yeah. I never heard that one before. Inflation is the surest way to fertilize the rich man's field with the sweat of the poor man's brow. Yeah. Essentially saying the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Yeah, and they're doing it by backstabbing them, right? You're surreptitiously taxing them by printing more money. And people not understanding how the system works just think well prices go up every year and that's just the natural way of things and uh, it's really kind of insidious in that sense so all right i just wanted to play you that part but he's so right about that um that's the whole central banking system by the way all right coil tweeted this out we're thrilled to partner with esl and put coil in the hands of more players and fans within the gaming community stay tuned as the partnership begins rolling out later this year and this is big because what we're talking about is this, um, I'm drawing a blank on what they call it. Um, anyway, this is ESL's website and let me show you, you can watch their video. Um, it's called eSports. I'm sorry. I, I should have remembered that. But anyway, you, if you watch this video, you look, this is a whole stadium packed with these kids. And basically what eSports is, is your kids, your kid, just like mine, that's sitting at home playing video games. Well, they can literally become an esports, almost like the equivalent of being a New York Yankee, but they can do it in esports where they go, they literally get on stage and they play these games in front of all these kids. Some of the biggest people on YouTube are basically playing video games and recording their screens. My, my sons watch this stuff all the time. These guys, it's a massive industry. And here's, um, I'll show you, right, not that, hold on. Well, if I can, let me do the allow. Okay, right here. This is from Statista. Esports market revenue worldwide from 2018 to 2023. It's right at a billion dollars in 2020. They're projecting it to be at 1.5 billion or so in uh, by 2023. So it's a massive industry. So the fact that Coil is getting into that, let me, I'll, I'll read you a, um, a quote from one of the guys here. He says, um, Many players today are also content creators themselves who can now use Coil to generate revenue from Coil members across all platforms. So you can see where this is um where this is going. You're going to these content creators in esports are going to be able to use Coil to monetize. Now, 
Val Jester Locke, um, I had seen a tweet where I wanted to show you this. We've shown this before on the channel, but now we're in this on the we're on the calendar where they where they said it would be. Swift is organizing an early adopter program to ensure the successful go-to market and community adoption of a full GPI solution for financial institution transfers. What you have to do, go live by the end of 2020. This is Swift, folks, Swift GPI. And then he's got an arrow to here. They don't show October, September, and then they show uh, November version two live. So that means that would mean, I think, mean that you would go live in October, right? Um, then right here, ready for bilateral testing, ready, go live. So it's right here in the middle of 2020, 2021. Um, let me see. That was, that was really it. But the point, my, my point that I wanted to make is, there's something about October. If you put everything together that we've been reading and seeing and videos and everything else, October, something about October, November, as far as um, they're telling you that things, uh, it says applications are open until the end of October, 2019 and must mention a single point of contact. Per so October obviously is a month just from looking at this. October is a month, October, November, obviously they've got some things that they're, they're shooting for. Um, now, Riz XRP. Now this is where I'm going to go back. I'm going to show you again. You can try to call it coincidence, but at the end of the day, there are 20, 30 things when you combine them all that, that had to happen at the right time in order for me to be here. That's why I call it a miracle. Well, in my opinion, folks, there are 20, 30, 100 things that had to happen for Ripple and that we've seen happen. And we've, you, if you, you seeing them individually is one thing, but I'm going to string together today the things we've seen with Ripple and the IMF. I'm going to, sw I'm going to string them together. But what led me to, to present this to you and you tell me at the end of what I'm about to show you, if you think, Oh, well, that's all a coincidence, then what you should do, you should sell all of your digital assets and just get out of this space completely. Because if you don't, if you think this is a coincidence after I get done going through this, you will never understand. And you, you shouldn't understand. All right. So, so I want to start here. This is an article from back on, um, and this is what, this is what Riz XRP sent me. This is an article from back and I'm going to read a decent amount of it. May 27th, 2020, new dollar backed by gold coming this October 2020. I want to read a good part of this so that you have a good understanding of what they're thinking and talking about. A new Bretton Woods minus the dollar. The IMS SDR is a form of world money. Remember that word, world money, created in 1969 as an alternative to the U.S. dollar. In, in case the dollar somehow fails, that was the idea. They were issued in, on several occasions from 1970 to 80. But then there were no issues for almost 30 years until August 2009, which was in response to the latest financial crisis. Well, here we go again. The IMF knows that SDRs are unpopular, but they also know that the world is desperate for liquidity right now during the uh, current events. To exploit this crisis, the elites are thinking big about a new Bretton Woods style conference. A new international finance system, financial system and a global tax system. SDRs would eventually replace the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency. According to a recent Project Syndicate report, both the IMF and the World Bank are being asked to throw away their rule books to save the world's imperiled developing economies. The problem with the current financial system hammered out in 1944 at Bretton Woods is that it was built for a different world aimed at Preventing worlds, think World War II, and regulating economic function on a global scale, clearing it as it was a world of industrial production, manufacturing, trade, most importantly, clear borders where physical goods, cash, and commodities were traded. Today's digital world hardly recognizes yesterday, yesterday's economic needs and reality. A new technological and, and governance structure is necessary to upgrade a defunct system, so, so goes the argument. If you read between the lines, the prospect looks le less like a rebalance and more like a fiscal reckoning on a global scale. 
When it comes to the IMF and the World Bank, voting rights are based on the size of each shareholder. The G20 nations make up the key players, the largest being the U.S. with 16.5% voting power and, conversely, veto power. Although the Trump administration has generally been cooperative with the IMF over the course of President Trump's tenure, things took a turn in recent months. President Trump's move to halt the World Health Organization funding took the world by surprise. Secondly, the U.S. Treasury Department made it clear that according to the news site Foreign Policy, it wasn't going along with the SDR bandwagon. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin viewing SDR expansion as ill-targeted. Because SDRs are issued on a systemic, symmetrical basis, um, in proportion to existing shareholding, 70% would go to G20 members, most of which did not need them. Only 3% would go to the most in need. If members of the G20 want to increase the SDRs available to poorer countries, they can start by lending them some of their state's foreign policy. So what's the immediate threat and Trump's potential response? Now listen close, folks. The rumor and big fears that the IMF may opt to remove the U.S. from the global SDR basket, effectively reducing the U.S. veto rights from the world stage. SDRs would then be a step closer to replacing the greenback as the world's reserve currency. Considering the potential damage that the Fed's QE will inflict on the dollar, weakening its status as the world's reserve current as the world's currency, the potential IMF move toward replacing greenbacks with SDRs would cause a massive deflation of the dollar, possibly up to 80%. As much as Trump has been influencing Fed actions, despite the bank's statement to the contrary, having pressured their 180 turn from raising to cutting rates amid a balance sheet reduction, President Trump has never been a fan of the Fed. With the Fed pledging to load up its balance sheet with the nation's debt skyrocketing to heights unprecedented, it seems as if the bank and nation would be heading toward a state of insolvency. But this is where things get interesting. With the IMF attempting to pull off a fiscal reckoning minus the U.S. dollar, President Trump may, as his advisor Judy Shelton has advocated, as President Kennedy tried to do in 1963, pull off a global reckoning of his own by issuing U.S. Treasury notes backed by gold. The new dollars would be pegged to gold, possibly at a modest starting point of 10K or even higher, effectively returning the gold standard. So following a massive plunge in dollar values, we'd see a surge in gold prices with the new dollars, a surge in gold-backed dollar values as well. I think you, you all see where the dangers are. And, and more importantly, the opportunities are as we approach the October deadline. I leave you with the president's Good Friday prayer for our nation to have its portion of silver and gold. So you can see how all, the, all this is lining up. What does all this have to do with Ripple? And, and, and look, folks, I'm telling you, as, as sure as I'm sitting here, this is none of this has been a coincidence that we have witnessed. You just watch. And, and for those of you that haven't been around the next, the last couple of years, pay attention because here we go. You tell me if these are coincidences. The first thing, which I've shown you several times, this is Ryan Zagone from November 18th. Maybe, that's maybe 2019. I'm not going to play this whole video because I've played it so many times, but this is when he's talking about how bit uh, proof of work doesn't work. But I, I don't know if we've ever talked too much about where he is. He's at an IMF event. This is Ross Lecklow, I think is his name, from the IMF. This was the deb deputy G general counsel for the IMF, I guess. But this is him right here, Ryan Zagone with Ripple. Yeah, invite so Ryan and yeah. Desiree, I don't know if you would like to comment on this. R the Lecklow Ryan. guy. Proof of work doesn't work. Defers to him. Yeah, proof of work doesn't work. It's been white. Okay, so there's Ryan Zagone. Well, you might see that and say, oh, okay, it's a big deal. He's at a conference uh, that's something sponsored by the IMF. Big deal. Okay. Well. Then why is he in this picture with Christine Lagarde? Okay, this is, I'm not sure what the date on this picture is, but that's Ryan Zagone of Ripple. That's Christine Lagarde, who at the time was running the IMF. And that is Ross Leckow or Lecklow, the guy that you saw on stage with him. And I believe, if I'm not going crazy, I just now recognize this. This is the Prime Minister of, Can I think that's, 
It may not be, but I think that's the Prime Minister of Canada. And when I see him, uh, Justin Trudeau, I believe is his name. I think that's who that is. It may not be, but I think it is. But if that is him, you might remember that Justin Trudeau was in a picture with Corey Johnson, the Ripple spokesman. And Corey Johnson said, I'll say it again. This matters. He was fired not too long after that. I think he was fired. I don't know. Um, okay, moving along. So here's Brad Garlinghouse on stage with the same guy, this Ross guy, who is their uh, in-house counsel, right? You want to take one? Go for it. The well, first one's for you. Notice Brad Garlinghouse. IMF. Do you see IMF holding crypto assets in the future? I did not put IMF that up there. IMF holding crypto assets in the future. Remember, I'm from the legal books. department. I'm supposed to be very conservative about these things. Um, I, I don't want to go into great details about Maybe the Maybe I should take what the IMF yeah, is going to uh, do. Uh, yes, exactly. So, Brad Garlinghouse on stage with him. Um, then we have, uh, and those of you that don't know, Brad Garlinghouse is um, the CEO of Ripple. <laughs> okay. All right. And then here's Christine Lagarde talking about Bitcoin. I think the, the role of the disruptors and anything that is using distributed ledger technology, whether you call it crypto assets, currencies or whatever, and it's far from the Bitcoins that far we from Bitcoin a year ago, that is clearly shaking the system. Uh, the voice that we heard, which was, I thought, really interesting, uh, were those of the, the regulators and central bank governors who said, well, yes, this is good and this is helpful and it is changing the business model of commercial banks. But we have to be mindful of two things, trust and stability of the system. All right, that's enough of that. And then we have this. And so now we have Brad Garlinghouse in the same room with Christine Lagarde. And you might know notice her as well. She's Jess Chang and she is, was with Ripple. I'll show you her in a second. We also have Ross right here, the same guy. Okay. I mean, at what point you've got to ask yourself, at what point is this not a coincidence any longer, folks? I mean, I think we were at that point just one or two slides ago, but don't worry. We've got more. Um, none of this just happened. And then here's Christine Larga Lagarde again, where she actually says ripple and circle. Circle and ripples. Okay. Um, one thing I wanted to go back and remind you of, I didn't cover it, but they, you know, at the, at the end of this, this article that I showed you a minute ago, they said, as we approach the October deadline, I wanted to make sure you understood what the deadline was. Um, it all comes down to what might happen this October when the International Monetary Fund meets October 12th through the 18th to revalue its special drawing rights. The world's reserve currency waiting in the wings, essentially a new Bretton Woods is in the making. Now, I'm not sitting here telling you that XRP is going to be in that SDR basket. What I am telling you is that I don't believe for a minute that in this whole discussion and whatever this new financial paradigm that we're about to enter, I do not believe for two seconds. I, I'll go out on a limb here. I will say XRP is is probably going to be the bridge currency to the world. And I believe XRP and XLM are in this game. Stellar. I believe they're both in this game. I don't believe anything that I'm showing you right now is a coincidence. I believe that this plan has been in motion for a long time. Now, let's keep going. So here we have a presentation to the IMF by Sagar Sarbai, Head of Government and Regulatory Affairs Asia Pacific at Ripple, November 2018. So we've got another person. He's presenting this. This is from the IMF's website. This is a Ripple presentation from their website. 
Interledger connects and coordinates ledgers. Um, he's, they're laying it all out about these different currencies, how they could join together. Um, uh, Bank of England, a customer of Ripple, Federal Reserve, faster payments tax, the faster payments task force. Ryan Zagone from Ripple was on the task force. Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority. Have we been watching things happening over there? Remember the peace deal with Trump recently? It's all connected, folks. International Monetary Fund. Right there, Ripple Platform for Innovation. Central banks and national infrastructures can in engage with Ripple to innovate with proven building blocks in distributed ledger technology. All right, moving along. All coincidences, right? Remember this, when Brad Garlinghouse was in Switzerland at, and the, the room was full of central bankers. This one runs Hong Kong, Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority right there. Director of Monetary Mar Markets at the IMF there. Christine Lagarde is right here. The um, Augustin Karstens, I think is his name, that runs the Bank for International Settlements, which is the, the, it's the central bank of central banks, um, is right there. And Brad Garlinghouse seems to be the only guy. There's just one guy from FinTech sitting there. <laughs> um, there's Christine Lagarde. There's Brad Garlinghouse. Um, and by the way, before we leave this, this lady right here runs the Russian Central Bank. And I'm sure if we looked around, everybody in this room, more or less, you know who this guy right here looks like? He looks like, he looks a lot. I, I can't see him close enough, but he looks a lot. Remember when David Schwartz did a podcast? Um, not too long ago, I think the guy's name was Iken Green. He was like a professor um, from, he, and he was a, a guy that he was a guy that was an advisor to the IMF. I think his name was Barry Iken Green. You can look it up. Somebody listening to me may be able to confirm this. I swear that looks a lot like the guy that David Schwartz was on the podcast in. Because remember, there are no coincidences. And let's let's go ahead and remind ourselves while I'm here. You can try to call it a coincidence, but at the end of the day, there are 20, 30 things. When you combine them all that ha had to happen at the right time in order for me to be here, that's why I, I call it a miracle. I call mi Ripple a miracle. I call what's going on here a miracle. I think it's a financial miracle for you and me if we recognize it for what it is. Now, so... Um, because for whatever reason, they, they have a, they have allotted a little bit of this, of this maybe for you and I to be the guinea pigs and we're in the sandbox out here and we get to own it. Okay. Or at least for a little while. Then you got Christine Lagarde and Steve Mnuchin, right? Remember Steve Mnuchin, he was, he ran One West Bank where the guy that runs the OCC now was his, one of his right hand men as well as the guy that did run the OCC and left. Okay. He, he leaves One West Bank. Steve Mnuchin leaves. Steve Mnuchin goes to be tre Treasury Secretary. The guy goes to Coinbase. He, Brian Brooks ends up at the OCC. Stuart Alderati worked for him at CIT Bank right before he went to the Treasury. He goes to Treasury. Stuart Alderati goes to be the General Counsel for Ripple. Whispering in Lagarde's ear. Here she's with Mark Carney from the Bank of England, who is a Ripple customer. We could go on and on with, with Mark Carney, but we won't. Let's stick to the IMF. Latest up, Stephen Bull Diep again. This is um, what he's talking about, The uh, Chris Larson. Uh, for those of you that don't know, he was on the IMF High Level Advisory Group meets in Singapore. This is from the IMF's website. This is that picture I showed you a minute ago. Christine Lagarde, Brad Garlinghouse right here, that Ross guy, Jess Ching or whatever her name was, right there. Then you scroll down. You can see right here, Chris Larson, Executive Chairman Ripple. This is from back in 2019. And then here, here's Jess Chang that is also in that picture. She has one, she has my favorite resume of, resume of everybody who's worked at Ripple. And here's why. <clears throat> because she was a counsel and officer at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and leaves there to go to Ripple. And then she leaves there to go to the International Monetary Fund, fund then she leaves there to go to the Federal Reserve Board. So let's go over that again. Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Ripple, IMF, Federal Res back to the Federal Reserve. What do you know? And this is her again. Jess Ching equals former Ripple employee from people who don't know now at IMF. And this is a post from her on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn. 
really great to have been a part of the IMF team that contributed to this landmark G7 report on stable coins. There's that word again. A baseline necessity for any coin is a sound legal basis. The report spells out what it means, citing uh, to IMF, uh, Bally FinTech agenda discussion on modern, modernizing legal frameworks. And here she is again. Um, this is Jess Ching at uh, the IMF opener 2018. This is an IMF event. The other category of fintech innovation in payments is where you have a whole new payment method. A new way for money to move that's different from anything we've seen before. So this could be crypto assets or it could be a blockchain based payment solution. And this is a space that I worked in at Ripple. And it's this space that I personally find fascinating and exciting. What's important about this category of fintech innovation is that you have a new way for value to flow. What's new is an opening up of the type of connections between people, institutions, entities all around the world. This is really important for cross-border payments. Payments generally flow pretty freely when it's just within a country, especially when people happen to have accounts with the same bank. But for payments from one country to another, that's where you run into inefficiencies and frictions. All right. The other. So there you go. And then there's this. Remember this? Ripple's an example because it has new technology that increases financial inclusion. Tobias Adrian IMF, watch this. And, you know, uh, a large part of the population in the world doesn't have access to bank accounts. Um, and even if it does have access to bank accounts, those are extremely expensive. It's expensive to make payments, wirements, international payments. So I think one of the big motivations for this new technology, right, because Augustine is asking why, is that there's huge financial exclusion and these technologies have proven to increase financial inclusion enormously. So I think you have to look broadly around the world. Uh, I think this is one motivation and I think the, the Ripple example is one example, or, you know, and, and Norman has talked about that, is that international payments are, are very expensive and the structure is not so, very well built. So he's telling you that he uses Ripple as an example. This is a guy at the IMF. He's using Ripple as an example of how you can help with financial inclusion. Well, that's right in sync with what the, this is the, um, I can't remember her name, but this is the lady that currently runs the IMF, uh, Georgieva or whatever her name is. She's the lady that currently runs the IMF and listen to what she said. Related risks and we ought to be able to guide the uh, use of financial resources appropriately. And finally, it has to be a smart system. Uh, obviously, we have technology being our big uh, helper on inclusion. Uh, but... Um, Technolo technology is our big helper on inclusion. Well, that guy from the IMS specifically mentioned Ripple technology for financial inclusion. So you have to wonder, is that what she's talking about too? I don't wonder. Uh, for, and then there was this from Stephen Bull Diet for cross-border payments. The use, <laughs> this is also, these are people at the IMF here. This is a guy who's a representative of the, of the IMF. Listen to what he says. Now, cross-border payments was a very different animal from yeah. domestic payments. Um, domestic payments, as we were saying before, are cleared by the central bank. Internationally, there's no central bank. So international payments need to be cleared and settled by large commercial banks. These are, are large institutions that hold balances with each other, right. that record the transactions that go across borders, mm -hmm. that take on significant risk, but also take advantage of a certain uh, monopolistic uh, behavior, position that makes for services to be very expensive. Now, how, how would this change now? Ah. How would this change? So, uh, in 
three main areas, or two main areas. Yes. I mean, we have some questions from the audience, so we want to make oh, sure that we have time for fantastic, that. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, thank you for sending questions, and, and we, we do want to get to them. Uh, so in the paper, we go through various case studies, various scenarios of how technology could change cross-border payments. I think the most interesting is the use of tokens. And now we go back to the virtual currency idea that we were relating to before. Mm -hmm. And what if, instead of going through the banking system, in, through these big commercial banks, what if uh, we use tokens to send money abroad? What if I could pick up my phone and uh, somehow transfer fiat currency, say dollars here in Washington, mm -hmm. into a token that is on my phone, press the button and have the token be sent to my friend in the Philippines on her cell phone. And she would then transfer those tokens into the local currency and go shopping with the money. Uh, that would, would bypass, you see, the entire yep. correspondent banking system. Mm -hmm. Could make for much faster payments, uh, cheaper payments, more traceable, better services altogether. Yep. And in the end, benefit. What in the world kind of technology could do that? I wonder. And so then finally, we have, we come to this, which is, this is Jim uh, Rickards. Let me see if I, I think I put it at the 20, 2245. Now remember who Jim Rickards is. This guy is connected all the way to the three letter agencies in government. This guy has been like a consultant to, to the U.S. government on the economy and different things. This guy's like connected. He's written several books on wh where all this is going. Listen to what he says. You know, Bear Stearns failed, Fannie Mae failed, Freddie Mac failed, Lehman failed. The, you know, Morgan Stanley was days away from failing. Goldman would have been next, then Citi, et cetera. Well, the Fed bailed out the um, uh, Wall Street. Well, the next time, the next crisis, and it's coming sooner than later, who's going to bail out the central banks? All they do, they keep moving the problem upstairs, some hedge funds to Wall Street, to central banks. Who's going to bail out the central bank? Well, the only clean balance sheet left is the IMF. Uh, so, uh, and, and Geithner was um, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, secretary of the Treasury, but he also worked at the IMF on, uh, on occasion. So I asked him, I said, uh, um, you know, I, I think the Fed's at the limit of what they can do. They printed their way out of the last one. I'm not sure they could print their way out of the next crisis because they've never cleaned up their balance sheet. And the IMF could issue, say, a trillion SDRs that would be worth about, you know, $1.5 trillion and hand them out to the members. It's just world money. It's a, it's a world printing press and world money. Um, now under the control of an American, by the way, David Lipton, since uh, Christine Lagarde has left to become head of the ECB. Uh, I said, do you expect that to happen? And he said, no. Uh, he said uh, uh, that you know, we tried it in 2009, which was true. They issued some SDRs at the end of 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, he said it was very clunky. It didn't work the way we expected. And I said, well, well then how will you solve the problem? Uh, and he, he told me, and I put that in the book in chapter six, I'll, I'll leave it to the readers, but it was a very interesting answer. I, I, I don't agree with the answer. There's, there was more to the dialogue. Geithner said it, um, and I put it in chapter six of my book, uh, which that's the chapter on the, on the global monetary reset. Uh, so it's in there. Subsequently, subsequent to that conversation, which took place in New York, I spent an hour in Hong Kong. Well, I was there for a few days, but spent an hour one-on-one. -on -one with the former head of the IMF. Uh, and I asked him about Geithner's critique of, of the IMF and of SDRs. And he, nice guy, but he just blew up. He said, that guy, he hates the, he hates the IMF. And so I, so I got an inside the IMF perspective on how SDRs work. And a lot of the stuff I knew from my own studies, my own research. But you know, as you said earlier, Lynette, it's one thing to, to read it, and study it, and understand it, which I do. It's another thing to talk to Geithner. I spoke one-on-one -on -one with Ben Bernanke in Korea. I spoke one-on-one -on -one with the head of the IMF in Hong Kong. So all these uh, um, you know, insights you get from speaking to the actual leaders, the actual yes. policy leaders, they're invaluable. You don't get that on TV or newspapers or websites or whatever. And I put all that in the book in chapter six. The title of that chapter, by the way, is the, the Mar-a-Lago Accord. I mean, what, what better place for a new Bretton Woods? Uh, if you think of it, President Trump, Trump. As a, as a convener, could call the heads of the major economies of the world together, get together Mar-a-Lago, Mar and, and do something like 
uh, Bretton Woods. I, I, I think that should happen. I don't think it will happen. Uh, that would be too rational a way to do it. It'll, it's more likely that we'll have another panic and all, everything we're talking about will be done under panic conditions in a very hurried way. But it would be great mm -hmm. if they could do it sort of proactively while there's still time. Well, all right. I just wanted to show you a clip of that just to let you know that, that I mean, Jim Rickards is more of a mainstream guy. And, and to hear a guy like this talking about the same thing, he, this guy, and, and we've shown you clips on here. This guy knows all about Ripple. He knows what Stellar is. And by the way, while I was putting all this together today with, about the IMF and Ripple, I just happened to come across a picture I'd never seen before. And I wanted to show it to you. Um, saw this photo I've never seen in a while. Uh, I've never seen while on Twitter this morning, XRP Gold, XLM Silver. This is Joyce Kim from Stellar at the UN. And I wanted to show this to you to let you know that there's, a, there's really only two digital assets that have been here. They've First of all, they've been here from the beginning. They're interconnected in so many ways. They're more or less the same tech. And they have they have been connected from day one. This right here that you're looking at, Stellar went to the UN within a year of, of forming. So you tell me what startup that's a year old gets access to the UN. And then you've got Ripple and they have access. Both of these companies have had access to the Federal Reserve. Here UN, we're talking IMF, BIS, you name it. World Economic Forum, all, all over the place. That doesn't happen unless there is something larger in play. And that's really the point of this whole video. You can't go look at coin market cap and go down that list. Go down the list of the digital assets that you hold and ask yourself which ones, which ones, what the companies that are that are around them or, or that are working on a use case for the digital assets you hold. Do they have anything bordering on what we've shown you here today? And the answer is no. I mean, there's it's just a big flat no. These two are the two. Now, when do they all of a sudden show what they're really worth? I don't know. But I think that it is a lot more imminent than a lot of people believe. That's just what I believe. Now, something hilarious that I saw this morning that made me laugh out loud is this coil blog, another parody blog by XRP, the standard productions. Every once in a while, he makes me laugh out loud. And when he does, I have to show it. Stuart Alderati is, is Ripple's general counsel. Ripple's Stuart Alderati kneels to protest lack of U.S. crypto regs. And if you go down here, um, he says, um, where, where did he say it? He says, I'm a proud patriotic American, said Alderati to XRP Productions reporters, and I always have been. But I can no longer stand by silently as this country refuses to provide crypto regulatory clarity. So we have Stuart Alderati kneeling. Um, and, and so this can't go on folks. We've got to, uh, we gotta, we gotta get some regulatory clarity so he doesn't have to kneel anymore. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Now I've had a lot of you asking me how, what it means to be an accredited investor. Cause I, I've talked about link to, um, you'll see L I N Q T O.com. If you haven't signed up for an account in the description of all my videos, um, you can, you can go in the description of all my videos and you can, um, Click on, there's a link, not just to their website, but also their app, their app in the iPhone store, um, or the Apple store, as well as the Google play store. If you, to, if you want to download their app, once you download their app, by the way, you, and, and sign up, you can then, um, then you're able to get invitations to their, their, um, investor conferences. And that's where some of these billionaires like Tim Draper and Greg Kidd and all those guys. But I'm going to take you out by playing you this awesome video that they put together. What is an accredited investor? So you have a better understanding of what it is. Have you ever wondered what it takes to become an accredited investor? What if I tell you there is no special official certification? Surprised? Now, here is the catch. For over 85 years, only wealthy individuals have been able to invest in early stage private companies. These investors are known as accredited investors. 
according to the US Accreditation Requirements Financial Test, in order to be considered accredited, your net worth must be at least $1 million, excluding your primary residence, or your income must be at least $200,000 individually, or $300,000 if combined with your spouse in each of the past two years. The accredited investor requirement has been broadened so that individuals who don't pass the financial test for income or net worth can still qualify. They can do so by holding FINRA licenses for Series 7, 82 or 65. Link to evidences such licenses by asking these individuals to provide their FINRA CRD numbers for verification. The accredited investor requirement is meant for US nationals only. Foreign nationals must qualify under the equivalent regulations in their home country. Certain foreign countries have no such regulation, meaning no one is restricted from investing in unlisted private market securities. Presently, only accredited investors can invest in privately owned companies. These companies are unlisted in any stock exchange, like the NY Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. Hence, they are not registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission SEC. The accredited investor requirement helps to prove investors have the sophistication and means to invest in potentially riskier investments, as well as whether any losses. But there is no exam or certification. So how can you prove to private companies that you're an accredited investor? Here is the way Link2 can verify you. 1. When placing your order on the Link2 platform, you can use Global ID. This is a partner application for portable digital identification. Two, another way is to work with the team at Link2, who can provide you a secure link to upload documents that will support your accredited investor qualification. Three, the easiest way is to have your CPA or financial advisor provide a letter verifying your net worth position, excluding your primary residence, or annual income over the past two years. If you do not have a financial advisor that can do this for you, you can provide copies of your financial statements yourself, such as W-2s, tax returns, bank and brokerage statements. Verifying your net worth or income qualifies. Go to link2.com to learn more. Private investing made simple. What a great video. I thought you needed to see that. That was awesome. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe and hit the like button and tell your friends and family that you can try to call it coincidence. But at the end of the day, there are 20, 30 things when you combine them, all that had to happen at the right time in order for me to be here. That's why I call it a miracle. Thank you for listening.